Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure you are aware of the most recent addition to the Christian Heritage series at Canon Press. Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards, with a fantastic introduction from Joe Rigney, is now available. Due to the shallowness of much modern Christian worship and life, we can often think of the display of intense religious emotions as a hypocritical outward show. And we are right to be suspicious, since the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9 Nevertheless, emotions are a gift from God and are a part of what God redeems. The center of the Christian religion is not our emotions, but Christ and His goodness. This classic will inspire you to consider both your life and your emotions and to follow Christ in love. Get Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards with an introduction from Joe Rigney today at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 137. 137. Thanks for coming. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for doing whatever it is you did to get these words coming to you. I'm currently reading a book by Gene Veith called Post Christian. I'm not done with it yet. Um, but it's a very, very fine um, bit of work. But he, he mentioned something in passing that got me thinking. And I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about it. Uh, traditionally, there's been a traditional breakdown of the mechanical arts, the fine arts, and the liberal arts. Mechanical arts, the fine arts, and the liberal arts. Translated into modern terms, let's say the mechanical arts would be um, the STEM fields. If you're going to college, you would get into, you know, science, technology, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, mathematics, those, those would be the, the mechanical arts. The fine arts would be painting and dance and sculpture and whatnot. And the liberal arts would be, historically, the liberal arts were not, there was not the reserve of the bookish people who wanted to read Pride and Prejudice instead of dancing, or who wanted to uh, read uh, Great uh, great American Lit um, instead of painting. Basically, what has happened is it used to be that theology was the queen of the sciences, the queen of the various disciplines, and the seven liberal arts were the trivium and the quadrivium, and the thing that tied them all together was theology, the queen of the sciences. What has happened, the liberal arts, in abandoning theology as their mistress, in abandoning lady wisdom, as the one who ties all the liberal arts together. They have simply turned the liberal arts into a a suburb of the fine arts. So you've got basically, uh, instead of the the threefold older division, mechanical arts, fine arts, and liberal arts, you've got the twofold division of science and the humanities. You've got the BS degree and the BA degree. One of the first consequences of this is uh, that because theology is not in the picture anymore, then the fine arts and the liberal arts get mushed together. And then another consequence of this is that the fine arts and the liberal arts don't have any idea of what they're supposed to be doing other than the artist expressing himself. Over on the other side, with the mechanical arts, there's enough telos built into the system where a semblance of normalcy, a semblance of common sense, common grace, lasts a lot longer. In other words, all the engineers still know that the bridge has to stay up. That's, uh, you know, it, it's self-evident. All the, all the engineers know that the bridge has to stay up. I heard a great story that was repeated to me about a time that uh, Ravi Zacharias was being given a tour of a university where he had some event. 
and they drove him by the uh, the museum of uh, fine arts, the, the the fine arts museum, and of course the architecture people are afflicted with the same disease that the artists are afflicted by, but the architect the ar- the architectural students, even though they have the same disease, are are still anchored to reality in that the building that they build has to s- remain standing or they get sued, right? The painting that you paint doesn't have to make any sense. The sculpture that you sculpt doesn't have to make any sense. The book that you write doesn't have to make any sense if you want to if you want to acquit yourself as a true artist. But the building you build, because the bridges still have to stay up, it's got to make some kind of sense, right? And so at this fine arts museum that they drove by, they had staircases that went up and didn't go anywhere and columns that didn't quite reach the ceiling and, you know, all kinds of absurdist things like that. And Zacharias said, quite on point, I bet they didn't do the foundations like that. I bet they didn't do the foundations like that because the foundations have to make sense, right? The foundations have to make sense. So when we're talking about mechanical arts, fine arts, and liberal arts, we are talking about, ultimately, we should be talking about Christ. In Colossians 1, it says, in Christ, all things hold together. If we want a return to a true liberal arts tradition, the liberal arts have to make sense. They have to return to the task of making sense. You have to paint pictures that make sense. You have to write books that make sense. I had a friend many years ago, well, still my friend, but many years ago, uh, uh, this friend of mine was uh, not, not a Christian, and he was a sociology major. And one time he got stoned out of his gourd and went and took his final in sociology. And the problem was that he aced it in that condition. And his reaction was, I have got to change majors. (laughs) uh, This is for the birds. And so he he switched to microbiology. Why? Because microbiology is a place where uh, things still have to cohere. It still has to conform to the way God made the world. Now, the mechanical arts, the mechanical arts, can tell you how to make a living, but the mechanical arts by themselves can't tell you how to make a life, right? The mechanical arts can tell you how to make a living, and they can tell you how to make a comfortable living, but they can't tell you how to make a life. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the liberal arts and the fine arts in their current condition can't tell you how to make a life either. And that's because the liberal arts should have been leading the way. The liberal arts should have been establishing a pattern or establishing a, uh, a rhythm or a, a cadence for everyone else to march to. But in the liberal arts, when we lost Christ, we lost our drummer. We lost the cadence. We lost the rhythm. We lost everything. And uh, there is no getting it back. There, there's no, and, and we're getting to the point where the mechanical arts are making less and less sense because. Ultimately, it's either Christ or chaos. So, Hamartiology, this is Hamartiology for episode 137 of the podcast. The word asotia is really interesting. Strictly speaking, it could be broken down as unsaved. Uh, the a uh, is a term of negation, and the asotia is related to salvation. So, strictly speaking, you could say unsaved. But the meaning of the word refers to riotous or excessive living. Christians are told to avoid drunkenness. And why? Because, Paul says, it is excess. It is not sober, not self-controlled, not disciplined, not upright. It is dissolute. So we see that in Ephesians 5.18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, asotia, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice here that uh, God is not saying no to something because he likes to say he likes saying no to things. He rather says no to it because he has something better planned. It's like your mother who's been working all afternoon on, on your favorite meal that you're about to enjoy in half an hour. And when you come in to the kitchen to grab a bag of chips, she says no 
not because she wants to rob you of your joy in the chips, but because she wants to not rob you of your joy in the meal she's prepared. So it's the same sort of thing here. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So Peter, the Apostle Peter, comments on how unbelievers think of this out-of-control living as being somehow entirely normal, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. In other words, they slander you, they run you down, they accuse you, they call you all kinds of names because you don't throw yourself into this flood of dissipation. You don't throw yourself into a sotia. And in the qualifications for church leadership, mandates that ministers and elders must have control over their households such that none of the, their offspring can be accused of living in this way. In Titus 1.6, it says, And if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So an elder has to have children who cannot be accused of asotia, of excess, of dissipation, of un unbridled living. So before we get too whipped up about women in the pulpit when they were commanded not to be there, or homosexuals who ought not to be there either, perhaps it would be good if we started by asking all the heterosexual men who are not qualified to be there to step down. We can't pitch a fit over the other team's unqualified candidates while giving a pass to our unqualified candidates. So my book review uh, this time is a book called Paul and First Century Letter Writing by a gent named Richards. Paul and First Century Letter Writing. This was a really fascinating book. We sometimes think that letter writing in the first century was very close to or related to or akin to our practice of writing letters. For those who are old enough to remember letter writing, um, in our era, letter writing has been supplanted by emailing, which was in turn supplanted by texting. We sometimes assume, well, I've, I've, I've been to my gran granny's house and she has a writing desk in the corner. And she goes over to the writing desk, sits down and gets out her special stationery and writes to all her grandchildren or writes to her great-grandchildren. And we think that when the Apostle Paul went to write the book of Colossians, he retreated to a study somewhere and sat down at a desk and got out of parchment and, and wrote his letter. Well, it turns out this is not like that at all. This book is filled with fascinating historical and archaeological details. And he pieces together a lot of references. So, for example, one of the common references in this book is to um, the letter writing of Cicero, who. Um, not only wrote a lot of letters, but who would talk about the letters or talk about the process of composition. A lot of information can be culled from letter writers who were um, descriptive of the process, right? There are many examples of how fascinating this was. Uh, Paul likely did not retreat into a study to a writing desk. Um, and, and one reason is that there were no writing desks. There were no writing desks until centuries after the time of Paul, um, the writing was done on someone's lap. And the writing would be, uh, no doubt, a group activity. So you would have different people contributing, you know, giving their two cents and that sort of thing. Of course, if, we, if it was signed by Paul, then he would sign off on the whole thing. Different writers, different secretaries would have notebooks of quotations and things that they could copy or, you know, as, as uh, if, if you were going to quote a hymn or a portion of a hymn, you could call that out of a notebook and put it in and so on. So what would happen frequently, you'd hire a secretary. You wouldn't necessarily hire them. You, if you had a trained, um, if you had a trained secretary in your entourage, you could use him to do the letter writing, but you could also go down to the marketplace and hire a guy and he would come up and he would take the dictation and produce for you a rough draft. So um, the rough draft would then be um, turned into, uh, you know, you, you would take the rough draft, produce a clean copy, come back, go over it, uh, and make, so there would be a series of drafts and writing a letter like 
the letter to the Colossians would likely take a few days. Um, writing a letter like the Book of Romans would likely have taken, uh, would, would likely have cost a couple of thousand bucks in modern terms, in terms of the parchments, in terms of the, um, the secretarial time and, and whatnot. Um, in um, another uh, aspect of this is the scroll, the, the ancient preferred model for a book was the scroll. And it is likely that, uh, and, and it's a matter of historical fact, that the codex, uh, meaning our modern book, where you flip the pages, turning them one, o- over, where it's uh, bound on one side and you flip the pages, that's a codex. Um, that is a Christian development. The Christians were uniquely attached to the codex. And so it's because of Christianity that the codex became the pattern or the template for uh, books all over the world now. Okay? And the, but the reason for the, the codex being so popular is that it's, it, if, you, if you gathered up all four Gospels and wanted to put them all on one scroll, they wouldn't fit. So a scroll would, if I remember correctly, it was something like 12 feet in length. But you could have a thick codex, and you could, put, um, you could put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into one codex, and they would all fit in one codex, and they wouldn't all fit on one scroll. In a similar way, uh, you could put all the letters of Paul would all fit in one codex, but the, uh, but the collected letters of St. Paul wouldn't fit on uh, a scroll. Also, another thing to keep in mind, Christians are fond of saying that they believe in the inerrancy of, the, uh, of everything the Scripture um, affirms in the original autographs. Well, there is, uh, I, I think there's another argument to be had for affirming the inspiration of the autographs, the, uh, the copies from the original. I, I want to say that God preserved his word down through history, but just shake free of the idea that there was only one autograph. It was standard operating procedure when someone made, wrote a letter for them to write a letter and to, keep, and to produce another copy for their own files. So you could, you could keep a copy for yourself and then you send the letter on. It was also because mail service was somewhat dicey. Um, it was also not unusual for people to send two letters. Um, by different routes. So you could send one letter by land and another letter by sea um, to increase your chances of the letter getting there. So um, this book is just a fascinating look into first century practices and assumptions. It helps us shake loose of how, how much we assume, how, how much of our own modern life uh, we project back into the apostles' time. And, and this book is a good way of shaking you loose of that. It's uh, just not that simple. It wasn't that way. Mm-hmm.